this is going to be a talk about side chains, federated chains, things I've been working on for the last couple of years or so. Um, so the one word side chain, it's quite overloaded. Um, the white paper is this famous parody uh, that um, some professor in South America did. It was uh, my my couch is a side chain. So here's my private side chain. And hopefully I can explain kind of the high level concepts. It's not gonna be mathematical models or anything like that, but explain uh, at a 50,000 foot view what these are, what these give you, and the different flavors that have been deployed in the last year or so. So first, you obviously have a blockchain. Um, it doesn't have to be a blockchain blockchain, but something that um, builds this consensus history together with others. Um, the state of the, the ledger or the, you know, the account model, whatever you're doing. Um, it's a uh, little digression. It's, um, we need not just time stamping, but things like proof of publication, proof of non-publication um, to allow us to have this shared history. So it's got to somehow fulfill this proof of publication um, requirement. Um, and in this case, it's not a main chain. It's, a, it's something that's connected to another chain. And this is what I call the sidechain feature. Uh, the sidechain aspect is not that it's just a blockchain that's not Bitcoin. That's kind of silly, because then Litecoin would be a sidechain. Instead, it has a kind of communication layer that allows it to move value to and from this, what I dub as a parent chain. Um, so a user wants to take his Bitcoin, put it into this new system, um, all while op uh, puts it into the new system, operates in that new system, in this new consensus system, and then at some point asks for the money to, to be moved out. Um, meanwhile, the parent chain doesn't necessarily have to have, have to know anything about the side chain um, semantics of the system, consensus building history uh, requirements. I'll go into more of that more into that later. And there are different ways of doing each of these components. Uh, so first, again, blockchains. It's consensus history outside of Bitcoin's consensus rules. So why would you want that? Well, you can have arbitrary consensus rules in this, in this subsystem. You can have faster block times. You can have a DAG instead of a tree. You can do uh, additional privacy features, you know, scaling. And there's no reason you have to be backwards compatible. Um, so and most of these systems, um, the deployed ones, they had things like confidential transactions, assets, um, account models. So the rootstock sidechain is actually based on the Ethereum virtual machine. So you move coins from a UTXO model into a side chain with a, an account model. So it doesn't have to be compatible at all. Um, who makes these blocks? Um, one version, miners make it, and this is dubbed merge mining often. So the um, com commitments are put inside of um, both blocks essentially that allow this kind of history to be um, tethered together and miners get to vote, essentially, to make blocks on the side chain. Um, and the other version is block signers. So get rid of miners. Instead, we make some private agreement that these, this set of people are allowed to make history in the side chain. Uh, miners, the, the feature here is um, you get to retain the dynamic set of signers. So in Bitcoin, miners can come and leave at will. And this allows you know, um, robustness um, at the cost of things like you need proof of work, which is energy intensive, but that's how you get it. Um, I left up proof of stake here just because I think it's kind of an oddball. So I'm just going to talk about this. Um, there's no, um, cons so there's no, Assuming you have some fancy script or some sort of opcode that allows this thing to happen, the consensus changes for the side chain don't have to happen on the main chain. It does raise minor requirements to stay profitable in a successful case. So if, say, uh, we make a big block side chain and everyone moves to that, then all the fees will be on that side. And to participate in this, you'll need to participate in it. Uh, you'll need to participate in creating this history. There are schemes to allow even non-participating miners to get the fees as well. I think it's called blind merge mining. Um, Paul Stork 
from Block. He's got various schemes for this. But then you have to think about the analysis of the game theory, um, who's being prof who's profitable when, and it's a little complicated. Um, one problem is if it's not mined enough. So if only, let's say, 2% of Bitcoin miners uh, merge mine the sidechain, then it's easily uh, uh, attacked. You can reorg pretty much any time. Uh, so an example of a fairly success successful one uh, is Namecoin. It's not used a lot, but it's merge mined a lot regardless. Um, and Namecoin is the DNS replacement uh, sidechain that, as far as I know, doesn't have any use, but it's an example. Um, next, we have federated block signers. So these um, federated meaning just a closed set. Um, the closed set can be dynamic, but not dynamic in the same way. Um, it's closed set and permissioned in that to enter the system, you must have permission from either the, uh, in general, permission from the signing set that was there originally, right? Uh, there's no way to just break your way in. Uh, you can't, you know, manufacture a, a mine or open a new mining uh, facility. You have to ask permission to be added to the set, added to the federation, or removed. Um, in general, it does something like an M of N multi signature scheme. Um, no energy required to sign multiple histories. So you get a lot uh, weaker guarantees in kind of the, um, the history that's being made. You have to really trust these signers to not double spend. Um, there are no consensus changes again and no requirement for other people to even know what you're doing. Um, yeah, and it relies on this operational security and incentives of possibly known entities. Um, the one nice thing is that with this, you can do all sorts of fancy algorithms. With a closed set of uh, participants, you can do um, basically no, no reorg chain, so you don't have to deal with any of these things that um, Brian talked about when dealing with wallets and services on top of these side chains. Um, and you also are, can do hybrid models. So Rootstock, as I mentioned before, they have some hybrid model that uh, it starts out as federated, and as miners start doing commitments into the sidechain, the weight of this vote gets slid over to miners. So uh, optimally for their, uh, the, ostensibly for the design, the optimal thing is 100% merge mining and no block signers. Um, next, so we talked about the block making from the, from the sidechain, and now we talked about the actual sidechain feature. How are funds moved? in and out of the system and how that affects it. Um, so uh, high level, funds are locked in Bitcoin, in the Bitcoin network, and then unlocked in the side chain. And after the fact, after the user's done uh, participating in this side system, um, the same thing happens in reverse. So we can think of this as a contract. Um, I put some Bitcoin into sidechain A, and I say, um, I don't want you to move, whoever is controlling these, I don't want you to move these funds until I come back out again, or until someone has a valid claim to take these funds. And Because in each case, um, the kind of pooled in funds is a big slush fund, right? If 100 people put in one Bitcoin each, it doesn't really matter that I get that one Bitcoin out later, it's that I get one of the Bitcoin out later, and that's there when it's time to move out. So again, we have miners that can enforce this, and a federated wallet. So you know, it's it's really um, a these set of signers. These instead of the block signers, it could be a different set of people, and it's really a wallet that's uh, yeah, um, federated. Uh, we also so inside Blockstream we call these watchmen. Uh, they're watching for people moving funds in and out. Um, so for minor contract enforcement, you use something that's called proof of proof of work, um, a compact, you know, proof that this, that the money you put into this lock stayed in the lock and won't be reorged out again by some 51, short term 51% attack. Um, the settling time determines security against reorg. So as far as I understand, the uh, Paul Stork's um, drive chain model, which he, they, they um, released some software recently, 
they have very long pegout periods. It's something like months. Uh, and I'll get back to why it's so long. Um, you can have shorter as well, but then you're only, your security buffer is that long. Um, so a 51% attack can actually make it insolvent. A, a miner could start doing false proofs on the side chain for longer than the security period and then present those proofs on the main chain since they're, they're controlling that much hash rate and then unlock the funds using that proof. Um, you know, and it might not even be a 51% attack in the kind of the classic, you know, sense of a big miner doing this. It could be just all miners clued and walk off with funds. It's really, it's not their money, you know. It's, um, in, in Bitcoin, even if miners 51% attack, they can't walk off with your money. They, you know, if, I, if I'm holding and my coins are a thousand blocks deep, until then, they can't even, they can't even reverse anything. Uh, in this model, uh, it doesn't matter if my money's old, uh, like a thousand blocks deep, if it, if the security, let's say security parameter is like a hundred blocks, then as long as they break that, they can just walk off with all my money. Um, this proof of proof of work thing is fairly complicated. So simpler alternatives have been created. Uh, Rootstock does a kind of very simple minor signaling opcode model where miners say, start, they start signaling over a long period. They say, hey, I'm going to move this money out to this address, like a list of addresses. And it relies on this social layer of people like realizing that the money's not going where the side chain said it was supposed to go and then taking corrective actions somehow. Um, I don't know, user activated soft work or something, I don't know. Um, instead, so on the other side of the coin, you can rely on this federated enforcement, these uh, watchmen as we call them. Um, so in one instance, uh, and uh, ones that have been implemented, you essentially give your funds directly to the Federation wallet. So we use pay to contract, which I mentioned yesterday. So it's the, where you can, so that, uh, I wish I had the slide up here, um, where you take the public keys of all the participants in this Federation, so it's a multi, you know, NMA multi-sig, take all of their pub keys and you tweak their pub keys by the hash of their public key appended to uh, the script. And this script is the thing that you'll, spend, you'll use to spend on the other side, is the script pub key. So um, the one thing about this is that you have to be compatible with today's Bitcoin signatures, with, um, um, the federated uh, multi-sig contract um, on the Bitcoin side. So on um, pre-segwit, due to the uh, P2SH push limit, um, it was actually only up to 15, um, end of 15 multi-sig. So you're, you could have up to 15 participants in this multi-sig federation. That determines where all the money goes. Um, Post segwit, it's actually bigger than this, but standardness rules. Even following normal standardness rules, you're, you can get up to n of 67. So you could have a federation of six, size of 67. And with fancier math, um, you can do unbounded pretty much um, using um, ECDSA um, pairing base cryptography tricks. You can get it down where it looks like one signature. You basically do the M of Nor, but do an ECDSA. Um, but it's more rounds, more engineering, uh, more uh, rounds, what I say rounds. Uh, the consensus algorithm, you have to do more back and forth communication, which just increases time, uh, latency, things like that. Um, and in this setting, the every, you know, every n minutes, you do a batch withdrawal from the side chain. So this multi-sig wallet uh, sees users requesting pegouts from the pretty please peg out requests from the side chain. And then every n minutes, they all agree, okay, these are valid peg out requests. We'll pay these out. And that's, uh, with all this, you have these wallet concerns and complexity. So you're really doing UTXO management, um, fee estimation, because you're not, a, because you're not a minor. Uh, you have all these things on top, which uh, are, can be a bit complex, but also, um, 
is nice in the sense of you don't have to ask permission for this. Um, a federated sidechain could be happening and you don't even know it, right, as a miner. Um, and again, you can try to do both. I believe that stock does that. Um, so there's a lot of parts and different kind of pieces you can put together. Um, you, uh, based on what you want, what you actually need, then you can select those pieces. So um, you have to think carefully about this. There was a lot of hype at the beginning about you know just letting the miners do everything, but uh, you know merge mine everything, all the things. Um, you have to think about really what you're trying to solve, uh, who you trust, um, selective tr based trust, right? Uh, do you trust miners or do you trust these corporations? That's right. You can select. Um, there are trade-offs everywhere. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm a bit partial to the federated model, but also they lose proof of work, which I really like. And you also have kind of these failure modes you have to think about. Sorry, it's not in these slides. I added this. Um, again, miners can censor funds on these federations, right? If they detect a side chain is happening and they don't like it, and they band together, they can censor. Um, miners stealing merge mine funds, it's a bad one. And then there's kind of the more subtle uh, one where a merge mine sidechain degenerates into what we call extension blocks, which is um, before I said these sidechains have no consensus uh, backwards compatibility requirements, but the miners or users, in fact, if everyone's using the sidechain, it basically almost becomes de facto Bitcoin. Um, and then everyone decides that actually, you know, if a miner cheats on the side chain, we should invalidate that block in, the, in Bitcoin. And then it basically becomes what's called an extension block. So now you're required, now miners are required, and full nodes are now required to run all the software, which, you know, reduces censorship resistance and possibly binds your consensus history to cutting edge crypto that you other, otherwise wouldn't accept, right, consensus risks. Um, and here's some links to things, sidechain like things. Um, so I've been working on the elements, which is liquid, to, uh, essentially the same code base as liquid code base. Um, there's RSK sidechain stuff, which I'm um, a little less familiar with, and pa the papers that are. Um, this, I believe, the, the Non-tractor proof of work is a more recent paper, and it was last year. Okay, and that's with Andrew Miller, I believe, and that's it. Thank you. <laughs> Questions? Good. Thank you for your talk. Um, I was just wondering. Um, first of all, is do you know if rootstock is a one-way pig or a two-way pig? It's 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 planning. So it's a it's an asymmetric peg. Okay, so, so sorry, one, I'm just one way. new terms. So it, it's a hybrid model in both senses. So mm -hmm. I believe I believe so. They could do it where the blocks are only signed by block signers, but mm -hmm. the federated peg is this hybrid model where mm -hmm. initially you trust the maybe the same people. The block signers are also mm -hmm. right. I'm just guessing here. Okay. And then over time, as miners signal their you know say. I'll participate in this merge mining, then you can start ratcheting over to just merge mining. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because what I was thinking was, is uh, you were talking about censorship and stealing of funds and, and things like that, is uh, if something like Rootstock, where the whole point of pegging in the Bitcoins is to create basically the equivalent of Ethereum on their side chain so that they can use the virtual machine, um, wouldn't it make sense to then make that a one-way peg so that there's no way for the miners to steal it out? Because if you're oh. just putting it in as like a fuel, oh, then... oh you mean as like a one-way uh, proof of burn peg? Yeah, so oh, okay. kind of like that, where yeah. you can only put it in, but you can't right. take it out. I guess yeah, I didn't talk about this. I'll just rephrase it, and then yeah. Um, so you can also do these are two-way pegs. Don't Google that term. Um, yeah, <laughs> it's it's an awful name. Um, so there's two-way communication between side chains. Th that means you have these concerns. You could just do, like, I, I believe, counterparty, right? Yeah. Count or is it master coin? Uh, counterparty also does burn. Okay, so they did a, a proof of burn. So you, you throw your money in this address, it burns the Bitcoin, but then it, it unlocks some token on this new XCP. system. XCP. Yeah. yeah, exactly, right. And so, yes, you could. They don't do that. Yeah. Okay, thanks.
Thank you.